Everyone, welcome to Card Player Lifestyle. Uh, we're going to be interviewing Eugene Catchalog. Eugene is a name that's probably familiar to longtime poker fans, but if you've only gotten into the game over the last few years, and there's certainly lots of you out there, you may not have heard of him. So here's a rundown. He's got almost $9.3 million <laughs> in lifetime tournament earnings, placing him second on the all-time money list for Ukraine. He was first for years until just about four months ago. Kudos to Igor Yurashovsky. Um, Eugene has won the trifecta. He's got a WPT title from back in 2007. Uh, he's got a WP, WSOP bracelet from 2011. And back in 2016, he also won a side event at the EPT. He's a former Bluff Magazine Player of the Year and was most notably a prominent member of Team Poker Stars Pro between the years of 2011 and 2016. The poker world hasn't heard too much from him as Eugene has mainly pursued other things, but he's with us today for a long overdue catch up. And when I say catch up, uh, Eugene, as you know, we first met back in January 2016 at the Poker Stars Caribbean Adventure. That was actually the first live poker event I've ever attended. It's been a minute. It's nice to see you and speak with you again today. Thank you, Robbie. Thank you for this nice introduction. And I actually do remember that that day in 2016 when when you came up to me in in uh, in, in the Bahamas because I, I just I remember I didn't recognize you as someone from the poker media and I was like oh that's that's a new face and I just I, for some for, for for some reason that I you know obviously I just kind of remembered you ever since then ever since you kind of became more prominent uh, in the poker media. So I appreciate cool. you saying that. Thanks. Because <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> like at the time I was I think about 34 years old and I had been doing it for a while, but. It was like I said, my first event, first live event that I ever attended. I've been, you know, as, as a home dad and you know, home with my kids a lot. So, uh, you know, now I started doing a lot more. But uh, yeah, you know, like eight years changes uh, quite a, quite a few things for both of us. That's for sure. That's yeah. for sure. Um, so, Eugene, you were born and raised in Ukraine, and you were living there until you were about ten years old before moving to the states. You lived there again from about twenty fifteen until about February 2022. Uh, we all know what happened uh, then. Um, and I feel that right around then, 2022, like early 2022, that's when the last time kind of like the poker world was kind of paying attention. You made noise in our in our industry when you went on some podcasts and you gave some interviews talking about your incredible tale of what it was like to escape uh, as the country was being invaded. Um, you told me just before we got on the call, though, that you're back in Kiev. So when did you move back uh, to Ukraine? How long were you outside of the country? Give us a little bit of a timeline. Sure. Um, yeah, so I, uh, just to kind of... Uh, 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 just to kind of backtrack, uh, I was born in Ukraine. I was actually born. It was back then. It was still the Soviet Union. So when I when I emigrated to the U.S., it was still the Soviet Union, um, and it was. So I'm, you know, I'm just an Amer I'm an Amer American citizen who then moved back uh, to Ukraine and stuff. Um, but yeah, uh, after after uh, I left uh, Ukraine, you know, as I as I as a lot of people closely followed uh, when the invasion began, um, I lived uh, in the Czech Republic for around five or six months. Um, and then uh, my wife and I decided to make a trip back to Kiev. It was kind of state things in the, in, in the capital sort of stabilized a bit. Um, and we needed to make to make our way back. For, my wife has a kind of like a growing business in Ukraine. Uh, she has a brand, a clothing brand. Um, so we came back to see how things were. And when we came back, we were like, oh, it's, I mean, it's actually reasonably OK. And, and we really missed it. Uh, so we actually just decided to, to stay. And we've lived here. Uh, we kind of moved back and stayed here ever since. Um, obviously it's, uh, it's kind of hard to describe an experience living in a country at war. Um, Kiev, uh, I mean, we've had our, I, I mean, I, <laughs> I, I, we've had our, um, experiences uh, with, with the bombings and, you know, with explosions and, you know, it, it, can, it can be a little, you know, <laughs> nerve wracking to say the list, the, the least, but overall, it's actually not, not so bad. Overall, uh, Kiev itself is fairly safe and uh you know for the most part life just kind of goes on here um i really i really like it here uh, i mean not with sending the war i just i like the people i like the culture my wife needs to be here for a business um i would say personally the thing that um uh, i guess is 
somewhat inconvenient for me personally is just uh, it's difficult to 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 come in and out of the country simply because there's no planes fly, flying mm. in and out so the only way to leave is either by car or by train so it just it adds like a, a full day um to to enter and an exit mm. um but besides besides that you know i i i i'm i'm here and i've uh, i'm in kiev and i i don't know I'll, i'll be here for the foreseeable future um i i kind of do need to remain in europe somewhere uh for for my business um and i do obviously hope that the war will will come to some sort of an end at some point and then you know perhaps like flights will resume and it'll just be kind of uh easier to travel um uh but when i think about potentially living anywhere else in some other country i just there's just nothing that really that i don't know attracts me i don't i don't know how to explain it it's just i i feel much more at home here um so that's it it's so it's so interesting cuz you know folks will hear that and just you know including myself i haven't been to ukraine since i was about 10 years old or so i was there uh, for a visit once um but we see what's going on in the news you're like oh like that's crazy and it's fascinating to hear from someone living in the country and hearing you know you continue to go about your day-to-day life you know people who know me know i live in another kind of war-torn region in israel very similar type of story a lot of people you know including yourself you're not here so you don't see what's going on you just see what's in the news but we continue on with our day-to-day life and i can also just say echo those sentiments of like it's still home and you know you kind of you know i've got my business and my wife has her business here and this is where my kids are like a very similar type of uh, parallel scenario so I am yeah. happy to hear that there is, you know, regular life continuing to go on. You feel safe and, you know, you go about your business, uh, you know, day to day in Kiev. I, I would say uh, you're absolutely right. And I would say what a lot of people don't realize is that um, the news only reports the, the negative sides. Obviously, no, no one's going to w- want to report in the news that, okay, you went about your day and, you know, in some country and nothing, nothing happened. It's only like when something happens that they report so that so people from from outside the country just assume that it's just constant bombs falling over and you know uh, right. but it's it's not really like that uh, you know uh, i mean obviously th- there are differences but um it's not it's not quite as extreme uh, as the news portrays it out to be sure well in those first few days though let's say those first few months you said you were living in the Czech republic i know you were very dedicated and focused to helping the cause you know fighting for a continued freedom and for the country to continue Uh, as had been prior to the invasion um and obviously you know you could say like the deck was shuffled you know your regular day to day life was upended for a period of time um to what degree if at all are you still involved in causes like that for your country and to what extent has your regular day to day life resumed from that chaos Yeah, I mean certainly the, the the most extreme help we were that that we, my wife and I and all of our friends were doing was was kind of in the beginning of the war um when it was really also like mostly needed before there was uh, any kind of uh, help on a on a government uh, level. Mm-hmm. Um but ever since then, you know, m- my help has mostly been just like on personal levels like you know to specific people uh who, who mm-hmm. need things. So you know whether whether someone needed a Starlink or someone needed um or or there was like a fundraise for some medical procedure for uh you know for in, for injured soldiers it's it's more stuff like that i don't i don't really talk about it too much i i just kind of you know my wife and i just kind of help when when we can if there's like a specific case um but but i don't really do anything on um on like uh what you call it like um like on on a high level uh, on an organizational level let's put it that way just because right. i i don't really know what the organization's doing so i don't really really know what where my money is going to be going so mm-hmm. i just i feel better if i know exactly where where that that this money is going to help someone sp- you know for a specific thing sure well this is obviously a, a poker oriented interview so most of the rest of what we're going to talk about is focused on that kind of stuff but you know of yeah. course we kind of have to address the obvious so thank you very much for being so open uh, about day to day life sure. in you know in a very interesting region of the world um about the poker scene you know again like i said the you know the last time you really made some noise was 2022 when you were leaving and on the poker podcast circuit but as far as activity in the poker world uh, i recall it being around 2017 uh you were still representing uh poker match for a few years uh, a ukrainian poker site 
Um, you went and played at the WSOP in 2022. I think at that point also you were kind of like donating some proceeds um, of your winnings, uh, you know, to causes in the Ukraine. Uh, but for the large part, you have been involved in other businesses. I remember in preparation for this interview, I watched a couple other interviews that you did, you know, back during the, the poker heyday. And, you know, you, you were giving like these TED Talk style things. You were doing a lot of Q&As at those Poker Stars events. And you had a very like business oriented head at the time. And clearly that those are the types of things you've uh, decided to pursue. Um, on your Instagram page, in your bio, you describe yourself now as an entrepreneur, investor, and former poker pro. So before we get into that other stuff, are there any elements of the poker lifestyle that you miss from when you were primarily just a poker pro? Yeah, certainly there are times when I when I miss it. I mean, I I, I always loved poker and I continue to love poker. I, I think we, uh, uh, what I'd like the, the way I'd like to see poker in my life from now on is like I wouldn't want to be a professional poker player. I would just love to play poker kind of recreationally or or sh uh, or, or or show to others what's so great about poker, but not necessarily as a professional player, but more, more as, as a, as a recreational player, like most players are. Mm -hmm. So I, I would say aspects that I miss in poker. I mean, certainly like, you know, it's like a balance, it, it, you know, on one hand, it was great to kind of travel the world, meet, you know, really, really interesting people. Um, but also when I did that for too long and too much, I also kind of got tired of that. I also wanted to kind of have, have like a home base and, and be home more, you know, uh, with, with my family. Um, but certainly now that I haven't been doing that for a long time, certainly it's, you know, um, uh, I do miss it at times, uh, kind of th the action uh, of it. Sure. Well, uh, you know, those who know me know that I'm big into mixed games. And when I was looking through your Hendon Mob profile, I was quite delighted to see that it wasn't just your standard, oh, you know, 75 million caches and no limit hold them. In fact, your WSOP bracelet back in 2011, it was in seven card stud. You won $122,000. You've got lots of non holdem caches on your hand in mob. Um, what is your favorite mixed game? And what do you like about mixed games that you feel is lacking in No Limit Hold'em? Uh, I've been a mixed game fan almost since the beginning when I started playing poker. Um, you know, even before I joined PokerStars, I was a high stakes mixed game uh, player, uh, cash game player. Um, so I've always enjoyed mixed games. Um, I think uh, the thing that I enjoy about mixed games the most, uh, well, besides the variety from just playing straight null and hold'em, is, is, the, is the fact that, you know, a lot of the games are still, they're not kind of like, if you can say solved, it, 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 you kind of have to still figure things out on your own. Hmm. Um, and the adaptation that you're do that that the adaptations that you have to make towards your opponents are of a slightly different style than they are uh, in No Limit Hold'em, um, and all the games are just so different. And I, I just that always fascinated me and uh, made them very very interesting for me. I I, just, I, I always felt like I was learning new things uh, mm -hmm. every time I was playing them. The, the games are really really deep. Uh, Stud is actually one of my favorite games. It's uh, it's incredibly deep. It, 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 it just like people who don't really know Hold'em don't realize how deep the game goes. It's the same thing right. for Stud. It can really, really go deep. Uh, but really, that's the case for, for all the games. Interesting. It's like Omaha High Low or, or the draw games. For sure. So something I always, you know, when I promote like my own mixed game festivals and why people should try it, one of the things I try to promote heavily is the fact that you can make some mistakes in mixed games and you still won't lose your pants, especially if you're playing relatively lower stakes. Whereas in No Limit Hold'em, you make one mistake, poof, your stack is gone or you're out of the tournament, whatever. Um, I guess, you know, now that you're pivoting more towards the industry side of poker, do you see that as something that should be promoted more, marketed more, like the appeal of mixed games that, you know, for the general positivity of the, of the poker ecosystem and keep money in more people's hands for longer to try to play more mixed games? Or is that just more of a byproduct and and you don't really see mixed games, you know, off too much. Well, I, I I'm certainly for promoting mixed games more. I, but but I also like I have to be realistic. I only I think there's like a limit to how many people will actually be interested in them. 
Um, it, it's I, I, I think it will still kind of remain niche. Um, mm. And, you know, a, a lot of people do like no limit for the fact that you can put your whole stack, you know, in the middle at any time. And that there's like a lot of emotions invo involved. Um, and, you know, to some degree, mixed games, uh, you know, are missing that at times. Mm. Um, but I do, I do think, um, like, I would put it this way. The problem that I see with poker today, with, with specifically with No Limit Hold'em, is that there are so many tools available that, um, uh, you know, for professional players to get better and better and better, you know, with, with, you know, with, the, with solvers and AI. I just feel like the advantage that, you know, the top pros have versus recreational players who are just mm -hmm. there to enjoy the game is kind of widening. And mm -hmm. what happens is that when it's widening so much, I feel like it makes it less prohibitive. It makes it more prohibitive for new players who are considering to learn poker to potentially join the game. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, so that that's the kind of problem I see with No Limit Hold'em. And I think it probably it's probably less so with mixed games, just because I guess because they're not they just there aren't like uh, solvers uh, for those games yet. So for those reasons, I feel like, like mixed games can be enjoyed more for by, by recreational players um, simply because you may get more bang for your buck, essentially, mm -hmm. you know, for a hundred dollar deposit or whatever, um, uh, you know, whereas before in the past, you know, the deposit can last you for a long time as a recreational player in no limit hold'em. Today, I think it's much less, you know, much less so. Uh, you you might have um, that same money will last you longer, whether it's mixed games or just normal casino games. Right, right. So, okay. So I do have to say then, undeniably the average level of poker play over the last few years it has risen right as you say like the, that gap is just so big there's so many learning tools so many training sites people are eager to learn though the fact of the matter is more people than ever are studying are in the lab and trying to get better they want to improve their game so in a sense it's obviously a, a sort of a natural progression for any industry um you know if you think about Let's say, for example, you know, the, the best ever Bjorn Borg, okay, uh, you know, he was a phenomenal tennis player back in his day. He won Wimbledon, you know, a whole bunch of times in a row, and he played with a wooden racket, okay? Put him against, you know, a top 200 player of today with the metal racket and all the technological advances of which you speak, and he'd barely be able to compete. So that being said, you know, are you saying that the sort of training tools and study is that good for the game, bad for the game, or just sort of need to take it in, in a little bit of a wider context? Uh, I think it's just a natural progression uh, of poker, just like it is in any game. Like the example you gave with, with tennis, I mean, that kind of applies to any sport. If you look, if you look, if you compare any sport today to where, you know, to where it was some decades ago, you'll see, you'll see, you know, a major difference in, in the level of uh, skill that, that's mm -hmm. required to kind of make it. So I think it's just the same thing uh, in poker. Um, so I think it's just a natural progression, and I definitely think for for professional poker, for you know poker at the highest levels, it's a great thing that there are all these like uh, tools that allow you to learn the, the game in a way that's never been available before. But having said that, the, the the problem that I see with that again is that it it makes it more prohibitive towards potentially recreational players who are not looking to money from poker they're not in it they have normal everyday jobs and i think this is like 99 percent of players i mean right. obviously there's like you know the few percent who are looking to go pro very few actually make it but okay but, but they're trying for the most people poker is just a game for entertainment just like any other game it's it's a right. way to spend time with your friends it's a it maybe it's a time you know you can go to the casino and have fun playing versus you know versus other opponents and if you win great but you're not there like trying to earn a living and i think if you're facing opponents who you feel like you have no shot against if you if you're like just never winning it's just not going to be very fun for you like the great thing about poker has all in the past has always been the fact that anyone can win i mean right. even though pros have an advantage it's not so large to where uh you know uh recreational players cannot win and right. that's my fear is that is that advantage getting so you know so you know so big that it's becoming prohibitive prohibitive right. and, and uninteresting thing for for people to approach I understand. Oh, yeah, that's a good uh, nuanced answer. That's a good good point. 
Um, okay, well, you know, we we've mentioned it before, you know, you are returning to poker. Obviously, you, you know, you may have been sort of gone, but, you know, people listening to you answer, obviously, poker is still at the very forefront of your mind, still sharp as a tech, you know what you're talking about, and you know what's going on in the poker industry still. Um, you're returning to the game sort of from the business side of things. And, you know, and anyone who's kind of been paying attention to your social media over the last while, you're kind of like dancing around, uh, you know, some sort of a new product. So maybe this is the big reveal. I, I'm curious. Can you tell us what exactly it is that you're hoping to do, that you're hoping to launch? And for, for whom is this product or service designed? Yeah, well, I, I can't go too much into the product yet, but but I'll say like the, the problem which uh, is kind of like uh, that I'm addressing is is kind of what I've already touched upon. The, this issue of uh, the the divide that's growing between professional players and recreational players, and mm -hmm. and how that can hurt growth in the poker ecosystem. So I'd like to um, kind of I'd like to see if there's a way to uh, accelerate growth uh, by bringing new players into poker, but by mm -hmm. actually leveling out the, the you know the, the 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 advantage that that's been kind of growing too much between pros and recreationals. And I think there's different ways that you can approach that. Um, you know, I, I think a lot of sites have been already been doing that with things like you know turbo, you know, like uh, turbo sit and goes and mm -hmm. um, uh, kind of. Uh, like the bomb pots, uh, mm -hmm. like that that feature. Um, th there's lots of ways that you can do it, uh, uh, kind of mathematically to to lower the advantage of pros. But mm -hmm. there's also, uh, you, but you can also look at it from other from other um, perspectives, like um, maybe increase the variance uh, in some instances to where. Uh, because increasing variances, increasing variance increases emotion, and and even pros are liable to that. And uh -huh. I think recreational players may like that if they can throw pro players off balance on an emotional level, because they're more liable to make mistakes, and that may be fun enough for them to still play with them. So I don't I don't mean to necessarily change the mechanics of of hold them, because I think that's been tried uh, okay. quite quite a few times. So to actually change the mechanics of the game, that that just makes it into a different game, and I'm not sure um, that'll work. But I right. think there's other things, other additions you can make to the game um, that'll uh, make it more fun for recreational players. Uh, perhaps lower the edge for pro players, but not so much to where it becomes you know unappealing for them to play. And these are the kind of the areas that I'd like to explore. Interesting, because I think okay. that's just a, that I think that's the case for you know for any game, even even if you go to a casino and and you look at just mathematically for uh, at any game in the casino um the casino obviously always has an edge but it's never so big to where uh the players never win right there's a reason why uh, like if it was just too big players would never come back right. i think it's the same thing in poker uh, recreational players need to come need to come even if they're disadvantaged it cannot be so big to where they don't come back right okay that's fair uh so we're not getting the big reveal but i do know that obviously like you said you're working towards this You've got you know, your team of developers who've been on this for, I believe, about a year or so. Um, you know, Being so involved in something like that, it's obviously something that takes a lot of time, a lot of effort, a lot of resources. What's the kind of thing that, that keeps you going? And the reason I asked that question is because, and I even saw this on a, a LinkedIn post you made recently, uh, you know, poker is often thought of on the industry side of things as like, you know, the little brother who you send to the corner. There's, you know, online casino makes all the money, online sports books makes all the money, all that other kind of those verticals as we refer to them. And then, oh yeah, there's also this, you know, sort of little online poker that'll make 3%, 5% of the revenue for a site. You know, like long ago, uh, these big mega sites that are, you know, offering gaming online, you know, they shifted from, okay, purely poker to, okay, poker is just one of the many things uh, that we offer. So. You know, you're working on it. You're developing whatever the, this is necessarily. What is it that keeps you going and believing that there's still, I don't know, room for a new player, a new um, uh, organization or service like this in the market when it's, again, relatively small in as far as like the, the online gaming uh, industry is concerned? Why are you so bullish? I, I think... Mm. 
kind of like, I would start from first principles. Like people are always looking for entertainment, um, whether it's in a casino, whether it's in poker, wh whatever it is, they're looking for entertainment. Where, um, and I, I think poker is a, is a, is a, is a great form of entertainment, but a, a lot of people uh, maybe think it's maybe a little bit too complicated or too complex uh, or a little too hard to enter. And I, I'd like to be able to show the game from, um, I guess, from a perspective uh, 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 of what made me love it and what so many other, why so many other poker players love it. Mm -hmm. um, and I, and I think, uh, like another problem that I see with poker is that it was always, uh, it was always tough to watch on television. It was always tough to make it interesting to watch on mm -hmm. television for non-poker players. Okay. Like watching a sport or watching esports was always kind of more entertaining than poker because poker. Unless you really understand it on a deep level, it can seem bland watching it, uh, watching streams of it. Like unless you really understand strategy. So what happens is, the only time people really tune in is like to watch, you know, uh, big pods being played or big emotions, uh, t you know, uh, uh, being films, expressed. Right, right. Yeah, highlight films exactly. But but when you're watching the game, it, uh, just it, live, it can seem very slow and kind of boring compared compared to other things. Okay. So I think this is another angle from. Um, where I'd like to kind of uh, uh, see if I can make poker more uh, entertaining to watch, so that there's kind of like more adrenaline, uh, and, and that, I think that'll uh, drive more uh, viewership towards the game and more interest. Now you're certainly uh, piquing my interest. Again, I don't know exactly what <laughs> this is, but uh, you've done a good job of saying a lot, not necessarily <laughs> revealing your hand. You're a good poker player, Eugene. <laughs> Um, I can ask, though, what would you say uh, is, I guess, sort of the timetable or the hoped for timetable in terms of where you are now until you are ready to launch? And what do you believe your next while will look like on the development and on this sort of, um, you know, getting ready to launch period of time? How, how's that going to look for you? And, and when can we expect to hear this, uh, you know, this news, this announcement? So uh, the project is actually big. It's, it's it's quite big. It's 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 bigger than just poker. So it's not it's not it's not segregated to just poker. So I think the first part of the project will probably launch towards the end of this year. Um, I'm hoping the the poker side the you know the the poker side of the project will launch early next year. So, so okay. sometime around then. Uh, but I'm sure I'll be able I'll be able to to talk about it already kind of uh, earlier than that. Okay. So cool. Those are approximate timelines. Okay, that's fair. Um, and I will ask just, you know, out of personal curiosity, when can we expect to see you back uh, at the felt again? I imagine, uh, you know, it's obviously in your self-interest to uh, be promoting this product once it's live. And, you know, a great way to do that is at the felt. Do you have a timetable for maybe the next uh, couple of live events you're going to attend? I do, actually. Yeah, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm hoping to almost like certainly going to attend uh, as my first event, EPT Cyprus. Um, oh, nice. October, right? Yeah. 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 I think it's in mid October, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um and then and then I'm and then also I might be at uh, in Las Vegas for the WPT championship uh, okay. as well. Um just like uh even if I, I'm not I don't think I'm even gonna be promoting the product. It's more like I just wanna kind of come back to poker. Again, not as a professional player, but actually just to make cool content to to show um what the life of a poker player is like and um, kind of explore poker from the content creation side rather than as a professional player, but more Very from cool. what makes it so interesting. Cool. Well, this isn't uh, like a whole hour long podcast, folks, or anything like that. Just, you know, we really kind of, you know, cut to the chase and got to the meat of things. Uh, Eugene, before we conclude the interview, is there any sort of message you'd like to leave uh, the audience, you know, with this platform to get out to as many eyeballs as possible? Anything you'd like to say to people or you want to solicit any sort of additional feedback? Go ahead and, uh, you know, say whatever you'd like to say. Yeah, I mean, I'm I'm, uh, I'm always open to feedback from people, especially like once once we launch, it'd be interesting to, to hear what people think. Um, but in general, I, there's not a particular message. In general, I would say I'm very optimistic you know, on poker, especially live poker, I think offline poker is uh, uh, growing leaps and bounds. Um, I'm a little bit, you know, concerned about how online poker is doing, at least in its current form. Mm -hmm. um, but I think in general, poker has a bright future and I'm kind of looking forward to seeing everyone at the tables again. 
That's pretty cool. I, I won't be uh, in Cyprus uh, in October, but I will be uh, at the WPT World Championship in December. It'd be great to see you again. Uh, cool. Folks, yeah, it'd be great to see you. Yeah, and I think they can follow you. Uh, well, just want to go ahead and share your socials, uh, Twitter, Instagram. Yeah, yeah. Basically, X and Instagram. Uh, I'm uh, on X. I'm e catch. Uh, e I think I'm on both. I'm e catch off. I'm not mistaken. Um, but you good. could just. Uh, and I have. Uh, yeah, I have LinkedIn, and I have a, and I just started a Medium uh, blog where where I release blogs as well. So excellent. That's well, that's a good way to sort of get in touch with you. Like you said, you want to get that feedback. So that's where to find Eugene, folks. Thanks very much for tuning into Card Player Lifestyle. And, uh, you know, you can always come back here anytime to enjoy interviews with top pros and interesting poker personalities. Thanks for tuning in, everybody. Thanks, Robbie.